Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So I've done the recording. So NSQ can look into it. All right. So now, um, again, to set the context, one quick question to all of you. What comes to your mind when you listen to this word called instructional design? What is ID to you? Basically, that's a question. Your thumbs on the chat box. Uh, it's a content development. Okay. A video learning, like how to develop videos. Okay. It's more into uh, digital learning. Digital the learning. flow of okay. the uh, session. Sorry? The flow of the session. The flow of the flow. session. Okay. Yeah. okay. All right. So designing Stop. all the okay. learning materials, basically uh, electronically. Okay, beautiful. Creating Plan. an effective and engaging, I mean, engaging or learning document, I mean, which basically includes analysis or design and development and implementation. So this is what an ID is. Ultimating, preparing a Bible. Yeah, to our it is all participants. Of... Plan yeah. and structural way, you know, have you put your thoughts into that? Methods and tools for uh, uh, delivering the content. Well, methods and tools. We have uh, more of planning and development using Divya, so one at a time, please. So that uh, uh, one at a time, we have Divya and Parul who who has raised their hands. Yes, please, quickly. Content development using Bloom's taxonomy. Using Bloom's taxonomy. Okay. Okay. Uh, according to me, instructional designing is all about understanding how our learners would engage with the content and the, designing the content in a way whether it is for uh, online delivery or for uh, uh, you know for face-to-face -face in instructions basically designing everything right from the learning objectives to the assessments um, and the learning aids that all, all comprises of instructional designing how the instructions should be given okay. to the learners got you got you fine we can go for two more two more uh, i believe it's uh, like uh, designing our entire training uh, program right from the training analysis and identification till the last part of impact analysis of the training. So everything, your content would be there, your training method would be there, your uh, feedback would be there, everything would be included. So okay. a complete okay. umbrella. Got it. One one more answer. Uh, it is it, it is the structure uh, given to the trainers uh, to, pro to proceed. Hmm. The where, which angle the tra training need to be provided. Need to be provided. Okay, okay. Fine. I will also help you now. See, uh, the this foundation of, for instructional design, uh, you know, was laid somewhere during the World War II, if you can't believe this, when hundreds and thousands of people uh, who needed to be taught very specific tasks in a short amount of time. Okay. Individual, um, you know, aspects of uh, complex tasks were broken down so that soldiers were able to understand, soldiers could understand and comprehend each step of the process. So this approach was later taken, built in leading to the development of what we are talking today, which is the instructional design, a field of study, which, which actually connects education, psychology, communication to create the most effective teaching plans training plans, whatever, however you call it, for a specific group of participants. Yeah. So this actually ensures that participants receive the instructions in a form that is effective, meaningful to them, uh, helping them better understand the topics, the concepts that is being taught. So instructional design is the creation of, like what you all said, uh, instructional materials, basically. Yeah. So this, this particular field goes beyond uh, simply creating these teaching materials. It, 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 because it carefully considers how the participants learn and what materials and methods will, will be effective in terms of helping these participants achieve their goals, their personal goals or the organizational goals. So this, this the, the, the entire principles of ID should be, uh, 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 you know, should, should consider how these tools, basically whatever you said, the tools should be designed, should be created and should be delivered to any kind of learning group, uh, to any kind of adult employees, you know, across all the industry sectors. 
So that is what is the understanding of instructional design. Okay. So we all know now instructional. I, I could see a lot of uh, uh, L&D professionals here. So ID, I mean, the instructional designers basically create, deliver uh, the training materials to learners from all walks of life in a variety of ways. They, they, they work with, uh, you know, traditional paper materials like handouts or manuals, which we use for, uh, uh, you know, our traditional programs, as well as e-learning technologies and the multimedia. You all said video and all that, right? So we do both of these. We, we, we combine all of these and we make it work. And our work, basically as instructional designers, our work can be seen in 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 from colleges to corporates that's what i would say because i added this word called you know educationist if you are if you're if any of the participants here are educationists and if you feel id is not for me no even for schools and universities id is becoming a you know most wanted kind of a uh a, a, a subject per se so whether it is academic sector or in, you know through the industries uh, you know, this is becoming more uh, wanted and all that. Okay. Now, corporate sector, instructional design is playing an integral role. Uh, most often don't see. Or if the if any organization is working on it, well and good. When, when we bring in new training programs, you know, when we are introducing new training programs to companies, instructional designers are the ones who systematically collect data, process the data, analyze the data, and determine if these uh, employees are uh, properly educated on the new topics that is being introduced. So if, if, if an area of the training uh, doesn't meet the previously set standards, yeah, then, and it's, it's a just responsibility of the instructional designer to revamp the course, to make sure that the learners are able to understand the, the 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 topic and make sure the company is working efficiently the resources are being used properly effectively so this is the basic thing that i wanted to talk to you about instructional design hope you got the crux of it now i'm quickly moving on to the next slide <clears throat> so a little bit of theory here and there yeah Okay, so we all know this pandemic. It has led to many major changes. Yeah. And even for instructional design, this field has also uh, uh, had a had a you know big change, a, a a developing change, a dynamic change. It has become a dynamic discipline now. Yeah, because We've all been introduced as remote teaching, distance learning programs. All of these became the new norm, right? Uh, uh, during this COVID-19 pandemic. And now while instructional designers have been researching and developing some optimal online learning approaches uh, all these years, subject matter experts and uh, you know learning professionals have, have started filling this gap. And this has become a uh, what I would say, a massive boon in demand for trained instructional designers so that we adopt many key instructional design trends. Yeah. So this is the good news if you all don't know or if any of you don't know. But however, this increased awareness, this increased appreciation for the entire field of ID, okay, is considered as a huge win after this pandemic for secure for securing some faculty buy in, uh, you know, more collaboration. I request all of you to mute. Uh, for more collaboration, uh, effective collaborations, that is not just enough. Instructional design will have to continue to hold things as one of the uh, what I would say most significant buzzwords. Yeah. When we look at the future of ID, we see a world that that is that that is building on a deep understanding of the participants, wherein we have to create new experiences to them. 
bring in intuitive technology, innovative technology to them. So we have to continuously work, um, you know, in, in tandem with uh, what's happening with the technology. So instructional design, instructional system, however you call it, it's mostly into creating a learning experience to your participants. So now this is the basic uh, understanding, the theory of your instructional systems. Okay. Now let me ask this for you. Uh, so with this understanding, would you like to frame a definition for instructional design quickly? I'll give opportunity to two people, okay? With this basic idea that uh, uh, I briefed you, what could be, what, what, how will you define an instructional design? Two people? Yes, Sudarshan Sharma. Yes, Mr. Sudarshan. You're muted. Ah, I know. No. Okay. So, uh, for this, I would like to go the uh, breaking up the desired expectation into the smaller steps or the uh, smaller tasks. Okay. If somebody has to design something, so the instructions of the, that particular desired uh, expectation has to be broken into smaller broken steps down into into chunks. okay okay yeah. okay fine the next is i think dr christina uh okay. yes ma'am uh one second yeah. uh, uh, just hold on uh again i i could see a lot of hands raised um you know again considering the timings and all that i'm giving the opportunity to two people we will keep this interactive only not to worry so i will i'll, I'll ensure that we will have a very participatory session yeah Yes, please. Go ahead, Dr. Krishna. Uh, yes, ma'am. So I would like to, uh, um, I mean, uh, define the instructional design as uh, it's a learning experience created to the participants by considering how the participants learn by using combinations of uh, visuals, audio, kinesthetics, and uh, uh, etc. Kinesthetic is a key word here. Okay, fine. Done. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, just to give you uh, some some theory, uh, it's there. It's there everywhere. It's there on the net. It's there in the materials. But then, you know, I thought I'll, I'll, I'll give you, I'll, I'm just pulling you into the concept. Uh, so these are the basic things that we need to understand when we get into, uh, I mean, when we, when we go far beyond this concept, okay? So we we all need to believe that uh, in, the, in, this, in this future of instructional design, which is leveraging new technology, uh, at the same time, we'll have to prioritize the needs of the learners, right? Uh, and we we believe, we, we strongly believe that the next wave of this instructional design, uh, the trends are taking shape. We need to cut through the noise. We need to find the best technology for our employees, for the participants. If you're in-house, if you're, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're an external trainer, whatever, whatever you are into, uh, we'll have to help demystify the present and the future of instructional design yeah um when we collaborate with an instructional designer and try to implement the trends it's more of forward thinking experience for the participants so this is what is the basis basics of your uh, id so there are a lot of uh, you know challenges if if i may again uh, talk a little, um, you know, basics of this instructional design. Um, before we explore this exciting ID, the trends on the horizon that we see in front of us, it is also important uh, to recognize the barriers. Barriers to success that is still existing in the field, correct? Um when the implementation of this instructional design, the methodologies will 
lead to enhanced leading uh, 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 enhanced outcomes uh, enhanced uh, you know output learning output there is always a lack of buy in lack of resources which is not always on this easy road though i say this is the buzzword this is the trend and all that so now lack of faculty buy -in. so this is an important point according to a recent survey the the struggle to collaborate with faculty yeah has been one of the largest hurdles for instructional design and corporates educationists whoever have not been properly shown the value of working with an instructional designer also there is a shortage of instructional designers uh, you know at at different levels okay in house instructional designers or or online experts education experts wherever you see the ratio of these specialists when compared to the rest of the uh, departments or domains or or training experts or however you call uh, is typically low so there is a scarcity leading to uh, a long wait times for id services i am not talking about the regular training i am talking about instructional design here so making it difficult for the corporate to take advantage of the opportunities in a in a timely fashion okay and there is also a limited pipeline for uh, training the instructional designers there are many certificate programs degree programs dedicated to training the next gen of instructional designers but do they have the capacity to keep up with the growing demand for this instructional design field is a question mark okay so having spoken about all of the all of these things now let me trigger you participants amazing lovely active participants to um, showcase your knowledge on what what could be a guess is also okay if you are not knowing about the instructional design trends okay what could be the instructional design trends that is there in the market maybe you can unmute and see or you can put it on the chat box also chat box it will be uh, helpful for others to look into it yes so, so couple of uh, trends that i am seeing is like a lot into the software space wherein like articulate has been a leader articulate 360 articulate storyline this has been like some of the leading software that are using hmm. and a lot of people are using the adi uh, adi model adi so, like model. analyze okay. yeah hmm. So these are the two major trends that I've been okay. like seeing right. in most of the industries. Right. Point taken. Next. Uh, I think it's I'm, the I'm use of. About, I'm talking about instructional design trends that you are using, incorporating, or you're aware of, whatever, whatever. I think Dr. Raghvi, micro learning. Micro learning. Super. Amazing. Next. Uh, I think it's the use of AI now. Like yeah. there are tools like Camtasia, which have uh, uh, like computer generated. Uh, uh, trainers okay which can deliver gotcha. content yeah. okay dr ragni about gamification gamification super and also Data. more into video based learning video based learning beautiful bite size learning which is available at the learner's disposal please come again bite sized learning content which is available at the learner's disposal so when wherever whatever time they have uh, to and spend on their learning space. Okay. yes right I, that means self-based learning, right? Self-paced learning. Yeah. Right. All right. Learning management systems. LMS. Anything else? Okay. Now, <clears throat> I think this we already spoke. Okay. Now, uh. Here are a few trending things that I wanted to talk. Of course, uh, you've been uh, uh, mentioning all of this, few of this. The first is about prioritization of learners. Well, when you when you focus on your course, okay, on the specific needs of your participants, it shouldn't be a, a brand new revelation. 
I mean, the the idea you know, should be repeating or something like that. When you consider the rest of the trends in the entire list, you, you have to keep in mind whether or not each of the trends is well suited to your individual training, classroom training or online training or whatever, whatever. See, most of the ideas can be implemented in a very in 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 different uh, you know varied scenarios, but only some will be less appropriate for your subject area, or it requires more of advanced technology than your participants who have access to. Okay, so instructional design process uh, itself needs to be analyzed in terms of the needs of the participants. Prioritization of learners is very important. As we keep continuing to evolve in this field, we bring in innovative trends, emerging innovative trends in the market. This principle of prioritizing the learners, the needs of the learners will always stay at the top of the entire list. First point, okay? Next is content curation. We all know content is the is the god of every single uh, you know delivery, right? And the 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 curation of um, you know high quality content, yeah, from different different sources, bringing a comprehensive course material is the is the buzzword here. Okay, we'll have to uh, we'll have to be able to tailor the topics to mirror the syllabus and, and this is more efficient and customizable than choosing a traditional a textbook or, a, or an e-textbook from a publisher, however, whatever, okay? The curation of materials from different sources will allow us to bring a richer variety of perspectives in our course. And third is about personalized learning. I mean, I've just mentioned few few things, okay, which I've, I wanted to, you know, merge everything and, and give you quickly on what are all the significant things as part of, uh, you know, the trending ID stuff. When technology is continuing to improve and we're also seeing a lot of increasing uh, uh, learning experiences that's being created, uh, personalized uh, uh, you know, usage of these learning by your participants for their performance towards their interests is very, very important, okay? Gen Z in particular, okay? Uh, they're using personalized content who are hyper-focused in customization across a variety of digital tools like, you know, like Netflix or whatever, whatever, correct? When, when, when a, a, a completely individualized LX uh, learning experience driven by someone said AI, artificial intelligence, is not likely in the cards for many organizations or many instructional designs. There is a rise in some personalized quizzes, computer generated feedback, yeah? If you see GRE, uh, uh, GRE is an adaptive exam, right? Uh, which will adjust its difficulty and the uh, score potential based on the test, the, the, the test taker's performance, the performance who, uh, by the test taker. So likewise, personalized learning is, is in the top. Video, someone said video. Your students or your, your participants uh, likely spend hours each day streaming content on this YouTube, Twitch, or Netflix, or any popular video delivery platforms, okay? This trend will carry over into the world of this idea, basically. When you, when you deliver some content through the video, it is nothing new, okay? The format, the delivery of these videos have actually been evolving over time. And you know what, mobile video consumption is like, you know, is, is increasing 100% every year. That is what statistics says. So when we offer short, bite-sized pieces of content, 
that convey information quickly, there is no test. Depending on the length of video, this can also go in hand with what someone said as micro learning. Okay. All right. We'll come back to that. <clears throat> Mobile learning. Your participants are all glued up to the smartphones. Not only participants, even we. Yeah, we're all glued up to the smartphones. And by next year, statistics say, say, says by 2025, another 72% of the world's internet users will only access the web through a smartphone. That is what a study says. Okay. And with this in mind, when your participants, uh, where they already are, this mobile learning experience, which is designed for the what do you call the on-the-go use can help your participants uh, stay engaged no matter where they are located. So that's another trend. And uh, new learning realities, virtual reality, augmented reality. Yeah, these experiences have already entered into this online learning game. Someone said gamification. So this virtual reality, which is what a fully immersive digital experience. This is this requires a high tech headset, high tech all high tech, um, you know tools. Uh, augmented reality adds a layer of digital information to a live view of the world. So this is what is actually happening. Uh, augmented reality is is a standard component of you know iOS devices nowadays. So more AR content is actually coming into the market. Okay. If this doesn't work for every subject area, it would be uh, you know, more effective for uh, human anatomy than some, you know, anything else. How can this serve as an information rich lens to the participants? Uh, how do you connect with the real world? With, where, wherein, you know, we'll have to apply new content every single time. So that's another thing that we all have to look into. But then these learning realities are also, you know, trending in terms of the learning uh, domain. Micro learning. Micro learning, if you, I think you all almost know it's an instructional design trend that is actually involving, uh, uh, involving sharing the course materials, basically, in uh, a small bite-sized learning units. Yeah, so it is used in terms of skill-based training or in some, you know, uh, classroom settings or in any professional development courses, it can be anywhere, okay? So uh, if, if you have participated or if you have delivered some kind of language learning mobile app, uh, which is actually going to push some notifications for us as small, small lessons, then it means you've already experienced micro learning through this. So that is what is the example for micro learning, <clears throat> interactive learning. Interactive learning, we all know again, your participants try to manipulate the course elements and answer the questions rather than simply reading a a course material or a textbook or whatever, whatever you give them. So like embedded quizzes, uh, some activities we give it, right? drag and drop activities, uh, wherein you engage your participants with, 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 with a deeper content. So that is interactive learning. So now quickly, let me again uh, pull in uh, the participants' uh, participation. What could be the social learning? When we what actually collaborate with learning? people and try to share uh, information, maybe I mean connecting with peers and then I mean learn mm -hmm. about things. Okay. All right. More of an interactive session kind of thing when we are talking with much of people and discussing things. Perfect. perfect. Um, your NGO is a perfect example of social learning. Thank you. <laughs> so social, social learning is a long-standing learning process, a process theory itself that emphasizes um, um, a learning through observation. You know, when you have peer groups, your participants are all there. They will learn more effectively, you know, when given the opportunity to interact, to converse, 
with each other about the content. Yeah. So the social learning will expand the environment, the the learning environment beyond the walls of the classroom or uh, you know your online course also, whatever, whatever. And uh, the next is gamification. Okay, now uh, maybe uh, people can share some gamification ideas if you have. Uh, maybe you can put it in the chat box also. Uh, what's trending in the market as part of gamification in the ID? Any viewpoints? Any perspectives? It is, there are LMS systems in which you know you have gamified uh, modules and assessments. Okay. Giving some reward points uh, for completing a course. Uh, hmm. Leaderboards are Leader another boards. example. Right. Uh, in in my company, like for ethics and compliance training, for example, they have these modules which have these themes like treasure hunt or uh, you know some sci-fi uh, situation going on like that. Okay, fine. Role play. Role play. Okay. That's it. Okay, gamification. Uh, if if you're not into it, it is about application of some game-like elements to the other environments. That's what it means. And uh, when uh, when when this gamification is applied to learning, it will it will actually create more engaging experience, a more motivating learning experience for the participants. Point systems or leaderboards, as you said, badges, uh, learning focused games or the examples. We have this Kahoot, for example. I think many of us have used Kahoot uh, easily. Online games. This will assess the uh, you know, participants com competency of a particular subject. So create some fun, a, a competitive atmosphere to people to the participants, all of these are through gamification. Rapid development. <clears throat> the digital world is moving quickly. We all know across industries, there is a, there is a growing demand to uh, bring about products and uh, you know release the content at a happening place. Many software companies Startups have adopted iterative design methodologies to, to, to rapidly develop, rapidly release some work. Uh, and, and instructional designers can follow that, follow the trend. So th this is what is rapid development, an iterative course development process, which allows your course to be easily updated over time as the need arises. And as you bring in some best practices to your to your participants, basically. so that is called as rapid rapid development. And measurement and analytics, I think, is again uh, very important. Uh, with any of these instructional design trends, it can sometimes be challenging for us to know whether the activity or the technology that is actually making a difference to our participants. Okay. So the rise of this data analytics has helped us as l &D professionals to measure from the student's perf performance. We, we can learn from the student's performance. That is the idea. Okay, so these are some trends that's um, there as part of ID. Yeah. So now can I move on to the next slide? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yes, Divya. Um, I had a little question, uh, Dr. Raghvi. I have heard that gamification and game-based learning are two uh, different concepts. So I just wanted an understanding about how uh, are they different from each other and are they different or not? I'm not very really sure about that. Okay, good question. I think uh, this is this is a very common question also. Any Anybody else would like to uh, answer this? Anybody uh, uh, has a perspective this, to this? 
her question is how is gamification different from uh, game based learning yeah so gamification is um, can i add something yes please i am trying to make this as an interactive session that's it uh, ma'am in my understanding uh, your voice is very low ma'am is it okay i'm sorry i'm not using the headphone uh, is it audible now is it better it's a little feeble yes please so ma'am uh, in my understanding uh, game based learning are basically for behavioral trainings and gamification can be used in crt as well as web based learning or lms or interactive learning on over the web that is the basic difference i think uh okay i think your voice is very very feeble okay anybody else uh i can give a shot yeah. so uh game based training would be one thing wherein you are doing an activity and then you are uh having some uh thought questions and you're learning from that activity that would be a game based training whereas okay. gamification would be you have you already have a content and now you are putting that into some form of an activity so in okay. the first one you are learning from the activity in the second one you have the content and you are putting that into the activity okay can you give an example for game based learning then so uh, game based learning can be a lot of obt trainings like uh, outbound trainings that we have so it could be as simple as uh, uh, one which i usually do is uh, a human not training so human not training is where in like uh, it's just an activity how you entangle the human not once you are done with it i ask the participants what are the learnings that you have from this so ideally it was a game but there are learnings coming out from the, that activity so it becomes a game based training whereas a gamification would be one of like i have a content ready with me but i want that to be very interactive for my participants so now i am putting some kind of an activity wherein the content is at the core okay okay so any example uh right now i'm not able to think of an example okay okay so see uh, uh i mean this is a very very good question i have many hands raised so before uh, i give the or 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 maybe uh, i'll give for I'll, i mean I, i we can go for two two perspectives quickly please can i yes please yes yes we have jugal no. also we have Jeevan Jyoti, yes, please yeah, quickly. In case of gamification, we just add a little bit motivation. Like, um, both are same learn learning perspective, but in gamification, we add all the motivation motivation factors. Like, we can give some badges, or we we can. Okay. 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 So badges like and that. Uh, so that okay, these are and okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. we'll go with jugal yeah so dr ravi i think uh, game based learning as to my understanding like whenever it comes to the uh, in sort of a management learning kind of a session or a behavioral session like where you use a lot of like energizers or maybe certain types of ice breakers to make certain concepts and some fundamentals to uh, make your participants understand so and apart from that when it comes to the gamification like where it it, it is more over related to like i am a part of training delivery so when it comes to a process or a product kind of a learning where you have the overall content and you really want certain type of a reiteration or you really would like your learners to create that sort of a muscle memory right. then you provide those instructions in the form of a gamification and all these instructions will lead to your ultimate output beautiful all right so um, so to to the participant who has raised the question so i think uh, uh to to quickly summarize see both of it is different okay it is about the integration of the game mechanics with the with the content of the training basically so this game based learning is actually uh, you know focused is is actually targeted maybe for a for a specific skill uh for a specific uh, uh competency kind of a thing whereas this gamification is about uh, as someone said it is about using the mechanics of the game uh, to 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 analyze the performance or the progress of the I mean, progress of what is happening like uh, you know what uh, jeevan said uh, through the leaderboards or through you know some points through some badges so this is the basic difference between gamification and game based learning 
Yeah. So can we move on now quickly? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So far, so good. Yes. 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 Ma Only few. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes, ma'am. It's clear. All right. Yes, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think we all know, uh, you know, uh, for any trainer or for any, for any speaker for that matter, I think uh, connection, uh, you know, this, this interaction, all these keeps going. So, again, we having a very virtual kind of a setup, uh, I, I, I really look forward for more interaction, more connecting so that we make this entire learning experience a lively one. That's it. Yeah? Yes, yes. Oh, ma'am. Okay, no, yes, thank you. thank you. All right, <clears throat> so now, um, I'm coming back to this uh, concepts of ID and all that. Uh, what, what best training methods can my employees get from me? Okay, because the benefits of using these kind of platforms are there, yeah, and we're using it making this as a standard practice. But then what is the best training method I can give to my employees? Okay. What I would say is the best training method is the one that works. Finding out is what matters. <coughs> as instructional designers, uh, we need to make the learning experience an engaging one a relevant one, a cost-effective one, and that creates a, a long-lasting uh, education or learning, okay? So when we uh, talk about all of this, there are many aspects of this instructional design. And uh, what I have brought in is the three most or best training methods that you can bring in. One is the presentation and delivery. Okay, presentation matters more than ever. We all know that the biggest trends we have seen um, all through our life as in trainers or HR or, you know, presenters or however you call yourself. I think there's an increased focus on presentation uh, and uh, we survive with that. Instructional designers, we are moving towards more engaging content with more visuals, with more videos so that your learners retain more information and increase their interaction with the course content basically. So the presentation has been prioritized because it adds a level of engagement Yeah, that that takes this online courses from uh, static fixed pages with some boring text to some engaging lessons that keeps the learners engaged. Okay, a high quality presentation is the key for captivating the audience. Please always remember that you can mix media content. Mixed media content is like, you know, including your text-based content with graphs or charts or images or videos so that your learners visualize the concepts, okay? Makes, in, makes the connection between various points in the text. That is what is mixed media content. Visual learners, not everyone is a visual learner. And it is important for us to understand the, the, the improvised learning experience, okay? The learners learn best when information is presented graphically okay so that we visually support learning objectives and provide a meaning to the concept or the idea uh, without requiring a lot of text-based uh, you know instruction or reading instruction kind of a thing then bringing about some Im immersive perspectives multimedia projects yeah uh, uh, where people explore through different modalities you know, a, a, audit, a geographical auditory, a 3D kind of a thing. So this will work together so that you create an immersive environment. Uh, uh, you know, uh, you can also, uh, you know, uh, see to it, you multitask and interact with the, uh, with the material 
so that you bring an immersive experience to the audience. Increased focus on accessibility. It is important for us to make all the content accessible for all the users. Making your site compatible is also important with the screen readers, keyboard only navigation. So you could have, I mean, I'm talking more of technology here. Captions on video clips so that hearing impaired people can also follow. Okay, so I'm just giving you an idea on this, okay? So mobile compatibility. Uh, uh, you know, mobile users again are growing, accessing online content. So we as instructional designers, we, we, we don't have the luxury of designing content without considering mobile needs, basically. That is the trend now. So smaller text sizes, okay? That is, that is best suited to your screen size. Again, uh, uh, features like, you know, offline reading, uh, you know, some voiceover options. So all of these can actually make your presentation even more good. So the next is storytelling. I think many of you know what is the storytelling. Using concise, authentic storytelling is, is gaining its popularity. Many corporates have started getting this um, uh, storytelling into this uh, L&D. Even in colleges grab, uh, or grab, uh, institutions like Great Lakes, all of this has storytelling methods of learning experience nowadays. Yeah, because it will help 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 to capture the gist of uh, uh, what is a complex information effectively without falling back on uh, uh, you know details that many learners will have some trouble to understand and all that. So, learning core concepts. Okay, will allow 80% of the retention. 20% is always reserved for some traditional fact-based approaches. So when you bring in this story, stories will appeal emotionally to them, to the participants. It will it will bring a, a, a imagery, a vivid imagery, which will provide information uh, that they understand uh, you know, in in a way or in a significant way, uh, it is it is context oriented. It is narrative and all that. Okay, so using some images, video, uh, through through your story, uh, with with some good languages, all of this will help you. Authenticity is important when we say uh, storytelling. Authenticity by connecting with real life examples, real life people which is very, very important. Uh, also, we'll have to determine which is important to, to, to the participants uh, so that we can re reach them quickly. Understanding the audience is important. And uh, sometimes our personal stories also matter if in case it's not so vulnerable. Uh, personal stories also can relate uh, easily. So authenticity is equally important, okay? So this is about uh, storytelling and focusing on engagement, interactivity. Yeah, uh, this is another trend again, uh, wherein full focus on interaction, engagement uh, with the audience. So when you bring in, uh, you know, especially this e-learning -E training and all that, if you're not bringing in all this engagement kind of a thing, it is not going to be effective. Learning is not going to be effective. So we, we just spoke about gamification, experiential learning. So when we utilize these kind of uh, approaches, learners will be more fully engaged in their learning process. So um, higher order thinking skills, problem solving. So when you bring in this kind of uh, engagement activities, I think, I think this goes... I mean, this this gets retained in the brain, uh, you know, for longer time. So these are certain things that I wanted to share with you. Yeah, clear? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Ma'am, can you just give a? Uh, can you able to give again a brief on presentation and delivery for a minute or two? Please come again. Can you please give a brief on presentation and delivery? For a minute or two in a brief you 
you want me to again talk about presentation maybe uh, end of the session can i connect back because again it will be a reiteration for everybody okay okay not it okay. all right so <clears throat> the basic components of an instructional design is about one clear goals clear objectives having some learning activities and number 3 it's about assessments these are the three pillars of instructional design what we call as a magic triangle of learning okay so id will be most effective and learning outcomes will be there when you follow these uh, you know three important things um all of these support each other basically these three pillars support each other with an intention of interdependence so that is how you can build in your uh, id product okay now quickly um uh, uh, you know when it comes to uh, id using the theories of instructional design in building some uh, teaching exercises all of these will definitely benefit um, you know your your learners but then there is always a ripple effect uh, because id is again a systematic uh, process systematic design uh, process which is rooted in theory okay id can leverage a skill can a, a, a knowledge to uh, your participants based on instructional activities instructional assessments as i told in the previous slide we have to align each of these with the objectives okay so creating a focused customized programs matter a lot encouraging the participants interaction participation is important clear uh, you know uh, objectives are important uh, simplified learning is also important though we say instructional design you are breaking into larger chunks and all that sometimes a simplified way of creating a learning experience is also important so all of these we'll have to carry in our mind okay so now quickly i want to understand from you what is learning to you so it's 1 pm now so moving on to the next topic yeah so what is learning to you quickly any new insight any new insight easier? all right put it in the chat box also so that uh, we can connect over there a process of acquiring a skill or a knowledge okay. a new skill or a knowledge here yeah. amazing quickly quickly Learning. Skill and attitude. Developing skills. Okay. Okay. Upgrading self. Something that I was not doing earlier, but start doing in a like decent manner. Okay. Good. Expanding Learning knowledge. Okay, I'm sorry. I think Changing learning is something. Learning is present, upgrading themselves. Okay. I think learning is a continuous process overall. So it's not just the new skill, maybe uh, improvising on the current skill on which we are working. So that is also part of learning. So anything which is additional uh, to the current part which you are learning apart from the new skill set. Beautiful. Hello. Hello. Yes, please. Yes, Mr. Uh, I think learning with current, as far as modern scenario, it is uh, what we have read that uh, learn, relearn, and unlearn. You have to learn new things, keep on revising, and also as well keep on revising the older learnings and also learn new skills. Also. Learning, relearning, unlearning. Fine. Okay. Done. Done. Okay. So <clears throat> we all know. When we talk about learning, the two things that we all remember. One, change must be relatively permanent. Correct? Change must be relatively permanent. This means, after learning, our behavior must be different, either better or worse as compared to our behavior prior to the learning experience that we had. For example, you learn to drive a car, okay, or have learned how to use a computer. So what happens? 
computer or a car before the learning experience you you have learned something and newly you're you're bringing a change either in a in a better way or in a worse way maybe that's a different story but this change the second point is that this change must occur due to some kind of experience or a practice this learning is not caused by any biological maturation but it's about the practice the experience yeah got it yes ma'am yes for example yes. a child does not learn to walk it is a natural biological phenomenon correct we do not learn to eat or drink so the the change must occur due to some kind of experience or a practice so this i think we all have to keep in mind because nature of learning is something when we come to id when we talk about id this learning plays a big role learning is a relatively permanent change in the knowledge or the behavior that actually results from practice or experience learning comes from change someone said knowledge change in knowledge change in behavior has to be relatively permanent long lasting okay and learning will have to take take place as a, a result of a practice through experience okay all of these are important as as part of learning okay now let us quickly talk about elements of learning what is motivation the first element in the learning part what is motivation here in the learning to know more new things okay need to of it further curiosity okay willingness or the openness to learn probably okay uh, okay. if it's leading to some reward okay that motivation is based on the need based on the goals motivation will act as a spur to learning with 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 some needs and goals as the stimuli to it actually okay is it not the curiosity that driv uh, drives it uh, i'll come back so what is what are cues then uh it could be a spark that i have to do this thing right now okay it's a, can we can we call it as a stimuli yes yes okay so stimuli uh, that gives direction to these motors okay now let us take this marketers marketers what they do they educate motivated consumer segments why their product will best fulfill their needs correct yes or no yes ma'am yes okay now in the market mar marketing mix we call it as marketing mix i think people in the sales and marketing will understand this we call this play place price packaging styling advertising branding all of these will serve as cues to help the consumers fulfill their needs in the specific ways cues will serve to the direct consumer drive when they are consistent with the consumers expectations for us our learners are the customers okay so cues stimuli how you are stimulating your audience is important next is response how an individual reacts to a drive the motivation or the cue constitutes his or her response learning will occur even if responses are not overt okay for example <clears throat> there is a carpet manufacturer who is wanting to provide consistent cues to a consumer who may not always succeed in stimulating a purchase even if that individual is wanting to buy is motivated to buy so the manufacturer may succeed only in forming a favorable image of the carpet say for example in the consumer's mind 
evoking the tendency to respond, ev evoking a tendency to uh, buy the product. So, response is, as, is how an individual reacts to the drive or the cue. So, this response matters a lot. And the next is reinforcement. Reinforcement would increase the likelihood that a specific response will occur in the future. And you know, the, as a result of this, this so-called cues, or stimuli, whatever, whatever we said. So, uh, how, okay, with the same experience, let me ask you, how, does, how do these marketing people create reinforcement in the customers? By a quick call on the by, next day. Uh, by providing some goodies. Goodies, exactly, exactly. After sales service. Exactly. See, if you take this... Telephone companies, okay, they give cash discounts to customers who pay their bill promptly. Okay, prompt payment, it is leading to some kind of a, you know, a goodie, a, a, a benefit for them. So, this is called a reinforcement. Okay. Learning is purposeful. Learning is a result of experience. Learning is multifaceted. Learning is an active process and we all have to believe this. Okay? And we have to strongly believe, take this learning as a motto, as a funda. And uh, for ID, this is very, very important. Now, quickly moving on to the learning styles. Okay? Ma'am, could you give an example for cues? Cues. I said stimuli. Cues are basically the stimuli. Okay? As I said, when... Um, uh, uh, say for example, the marketers are there. So consumers will expect some, I mean, I'm taking this in as, as an example because a product will reach easily. That is why. A consumer expects high fashion stores, okay, to carry some design clothing. So a high fashion des designer should distribute his or her clothing only through exclusive stores. Advertise only in quality fashion magazines because he is a high fashion designer. So, say for example, um, a, a brand called Page 3. Do you know that? Page 3? Anyone mm. here? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. What, what, what does Page 3 do? Advertisement. No, 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 not advertisement. Isn't it a saloon or something? Saloon, yes, exactly. Yeah. Any idea? Uh, 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 whom does it cater? Page 3 caters to whom? Um, fashion industry and the film industry. Film industry, fashion industry. A, no a normal general public person would not go to page 3. It is not, it is not, uh, 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 you know, important to do that. But just, you know, to, to segregate the market, there is one brand called Page 3, which is, which is exclusively open for people with high profiles or people who wanted to go on extra fashion, extra, uh, you know, beauty oriented. So when people are targeted towards that kind of consumers, that kind of a designer or that, uh, that kind of a salon, People will only go to those exclusive stores, exclusive brands. So in terms of the learning for us, cues are the stimuli. Only these cues will go straightly hit the target audience, wherein through the stimuli, uh, the motive for learning, okay, the motive for learning will get a direction towards getting that learning experience. So stim through stimuli only, you will, as a participant, I will be able to get motivated through the way I want to learn. So this is stimuli. So this is, uh, again, a cycle, a circle. You have a goal. I mean, you set a goal to the audience. You create a stimuli. You, you get the response. You try to reinforce. And the process keeps continuing. 
that is the learning experience okay clear uh, can you please uh, like tell uh, again about the last point reinforcement reinforcement uh, um, okay maybe uh, i am planning to finish off uh, you know till till a number of slides maybe in the last i will again come back to you and we'll talk about it okay okay is that okay for you no problem no problem okay thank you so learning styles what do you see in the picture Quickly, visual, what do you see in the picture? Visual, auditory, visual, and kinesthetic. 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 Visual learners learn primarily through the written word. We all know. They tend to be the readers who diligently take, take down every single word, you know, which is there on the slide. Whereas auditory learners, they learn primarily through listening. And they focus their ears and attention on your words, what you talk. Listening carefully to everything you say. They like to talk rather than write. Okay? They relish the opportunity to discuss what they heard rather than writing and all that. Whereas kinesthetic learnings are, I mean, I mean, these, these learners learn better by doing. This group learns best when they practice that, you know, practice what they're learning basically. They want to have their hands on the keyboard. They want to have their hands on the hammer or they want to ha have their hands on the test tube because they think in terms of physical attention. So these are the three different styles of learners. Now, why am I bringing this slide here? You will have different audience, different audience group with different styles. How do you cater to one common um, you know, participant group? who are into different learning styles. Yeah, so that is the challenge. And uh, uh, let me again open up one perspective from any of you who can uh, give sh some insight on um, a participant group who will have different styles like this. And how do you go about with your training process? Or the how, 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 um, how better way you can bring about this learning experience to the multifaceted, multi-styled participant group. I have one Mr. Sudarshan raised, raised his hand. Yes, please. Okay. So, uh, again, uh, like, can I talk in Hindi? Is there really any language? Or will it be okay? It should be better. Okay. No problem. Sorry. So, uh, so if, uh, like, there will be people who are auditory, there will be people who will be vis uh, visuals, and then the kinesthetic. But we all are not just the uh, one single terminology using for the uh, learnings. We all are multi-module uh, learners. So I might be the better in kinesthetics, good at auditory, but not so good at visuals. And similarly, when we do conduct our trainings or any uh, sort of learning interventions in either in office or uh, wherever we want to do. One second, please. Yes. So there we use uh, the language. So that is kind of auditory. We use the videos or the pictures that uh, comes from the visuals. And when we do any uh, sort of uh, activity. Okay, thank, we, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, audit, uh, sorry, my, my doubt is sorry to break you. My, my question is how do you cater to uh, the uh, participant group, which is going to have all of these styles of people? Okay. So it will be probably a blend of all these things. That's so what I was be saying. A blend of, yeah. I'll be using the pictures, videos, games, and the interaction. Okay. Okay. So is it a, is it a working model? Is it going to be a viable, flexible, conducive model? Will it work? Just just to again. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. It depends on the feedback. Depends on the feedback of the audience. Okay. So I, I asked if will this work out? Will this work out when it is going to have a blend of uh, all of these learning styles? Absolutely, it does. Okay, yes, Neha. So I'll just give an example of what we used to do in communication skills for new trainees that we used to hire. We used to make them, uh, we used to show a video of, let's say, a phone call with a client. Oh. Then we used to break them up into groups, ask them to discuss. So that was catering to visual as well as auditory. And then we would have a role play in order to represent it. So it kind of covered all three aspects of learning styles. Beautiful. Okay, that's an example. Yes. So finally, one, Mr. Nikhil, if you can quickly answer. Yes, please. 
Sure. Uh, so one thing I would say, it also depends on the kind of content that we are delivering. Just an example, if it's a compliance training, a new compliance is coming up, you cannot have a, a kinesthetic thing into it. It has to be either a, a visual or an auditory one, number one. Second thing, what I believe is every person would have some element of kinesthetic, auditory and visual. There would be one who is more uh, empowered. For a, for a person like me, I would be someone who would love kinesthetic and auditory as well but visual is something which is at a like i have a better retention power into it so a blend of all would work but also that depends on the kind of content that you have to deliver thank you thank you this is something elaborative and this is something that was expecting also thank you so every person will have a, a, a more uh, you know that way a small of you know how we get into this learning process so in that way, if we can explain, someone said this word called <clears throat> this blend of learning styles plays a big role, and uh, uh, you know, that is where we, as uh, instructional designers, uh, hello, no, ma'am, yes, please, ma'am, we lost you in between request to repeat you know the 10 or 20 second things that you said there was some some serious noise coming from your end is that now now it's better ma'am if you could just uh, repeat what no, you said is, is that the way the other participants are also uh, hearing me like uh, that yes, someone else was that sound was somebody have unmuted that is the reason it is not from your end Thank you, thank but you. Can you please repeat it? That will be better. Yeah, I said it's it, when when you're going to have a mixture of audience, a person will have a have more of visual, a little of auditory, and little of kinesthetic style. Maybe it can be in pro proportions. It is not like you know, I if I am auditory, I am not kinesthetic. It is not that way. Any learner will have a proportion of each of these styles, and we'll have to cater to that according to. Uh, you know the way uh, the the courses. It all matters about what training we give and in which training. Um, you know, for example, when it is a product training, when it is about showing a demo, I can't always keep this. Uh, you know, uh, showing them the visuals of it. I'll have to make them make their hands dirty, make them you know work on this product so that they get the understanding well. So in that way, based on the course material, based on the course, which course, which training you're offering, you will have to uh, work according to the learning style. So that is what I was saying. And quickly, what you could see this uh, see in this slide is the process of learning. And when you take about process, I mean, different books, different topics will have a you know different way of showcasing uh, you know the 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 so called process as such. But this is a common way you can understand the learning process. Maybe if, uh, I mean, this is not an important question kind of a thing, but I, I really wanted to showcase how is this process going to happen or what are all the elements that is involved in the process of learning, uh, the, the entire learning thing, okay? So now when it comes to learning process, you'll have a stimuli, you'll have an attention towards it, you'll have some recognition, will have some translation, reinforcement happening, uh, you know, behaviors happening, rewards, somebody said rewards, habits, motives, efforts, all of these are part of learning process, okay? <clears throat> and uh, everything, every process will have an input, a processing and out, uh, an outcome kind of a thing, correct? Any process will have the same mixture, input, process output so the factors involved the elements involved here are the goals okay the goals in what channel are you giving this learning process in which context and what technology so based on this uh, the learning processes will happen and the outcome will be based on skill or knowledge or attitude or behavior whatever whatever and that is where you play a role, whether it is, you know, a satisfied learning experience that you have provided or not. So this is a basic model, basic process for you to understand how this learning happens. I'm not going to spend much time in this, but I'm going to quickly move on to this. Have you heard about this? The three major types of behavioral learning. 
Ma'am, your, your screen is uh, getting blurred. The previous slide was also blurred and this one is blurred as well. Maybe the images are like that. I'll be sending the PPT also to you through the uh, NHQ. Maybe you can have it. Okay. So uh, I think this is a very common subject. The three major types of behavioral learning. Anybody with me? I, yes, have I, I know yes. about the classical conditioning. Okay. Quickly, one each one can talk about each of these learning. I will also help you out. What is classical conditioning? So basically, you uh, give a reward for a behavior. And then in the anticipation of that reward, the the, the participant is demonstrating that behavior. Example? The example which we have shown on the screen. <laughs> for example, you bell, a ring, you bell a ring, then you give a a bone to a dog and the the moment uh, the uh, dog will hear a bell sound his uh, tongue will sal start to salivate because he's expecting a bone out after that yeah. uh, it's an uh, like an unconditioned stimulus which is you know converted to a conditioned yes. uh, response so if, if i may add in uh, a very basic example because i have a dog so because i saw that so that uh, yes best uh, example will be whenever we are going out or if they are barking or if we are doing something if they are we are going out we actually train them with few of the terms which is healing heal means you have to walk while i am walking my dog will walk with me and i'm giving a treat in response to that so that is the way of learning uh, that is all about classical conditioning okay so uh, how many of you know the story of dog salivating when you ring a bell, show a bone. Anybody with me who has read this in the organizational behavior? Oh, it's yeah, it's Pavlov's theory. It's Pavlov's theory, exactly. So that is a quick example of what, what is this. Okay. So <clears throat> the story is, is all about, uh, uh, you know, you, you, you ring a bell, keep a bone in front of the dog, um it will come and eat it okay when you repeat this um you 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 keep ringing the bell you keep the food for the dog and it comes and eats at one point in time because it is conditioned now okay at one point in time if you just ring the bell and you're not keeping any bone for it what will happen the dog will salivate the dog will in salivate. anticipation expect, of the food. Yeah, it will expect that, you know, the bell bell has rung and there is going to be, you know, some food in front of me. So, that is what is, uh, you know, this theory all about. This is, this is called as classical conditioning. And now let me ask this, how is this going to uh, help us in our learning experience to the participants quickly like uh, if we want a behavior to be repeated just yeah. like uh, the dog was presented with the reward yeah. like food in this case okay so in real life with people we can uh, give them rewards for a positive behavior okay. and the likelihood of uh, the repetition of that behavior would increase Beautiful, beautiful answer. Thank you. Yes? Clear? Yes, clear, clear. Good to go? Seems a little theoretical. Interesting. Okay, now, what is operant conditioning? Operant conditioning. Skinner's operant conditioning, if I may use this word. Okay. Surprising so I... people are little non-participative. Maybe I will only help. Not no, no worries. Operant conditioning is again another instrumental conditioning. Again, a, a method of learning 
which employ some rewards and punishments for a behavior. Very simple. Okay. And here an association is made between a behavior and a consequence. Negative or positive. Okay. Uh, operant conditioning is, is not just something that takes place in experimental settings. Okay. It is a powerful role in a everyday, every, everybody's everyday's life. Reinforcement, punishment takes place in natural settings all the time. Okay. Uh, especially in the classroom sessions. This B.E. Skinner, he was the one who actually brought, brought this. Uh, he's a behaviorist, basically. He brought this. So this, um, uh, this, this, this operant conditioning says that actions that are followed by reinforcement, okay, will be strengthened, more likely to again in the future. If you tell a funny story in your in your in your in your training session, what happens? Everybody laughs at it. So you will probably be more likely to tell that story again in the future because people are laughing at it. Because if you're because they are enjoying it. Okay. If you raise your hand to ask a question, okay, and um uh and I mean, this is happening in this in this forum also. And you're getting an opportunity to, to share your uh, viewpoints. Then it is more likely to, uh, you know, uh, for the other participants to raise their hand the next time so that we make it a very, very participatory, reinforcing one. Same way it is the other, other way around. Punishments. If there's anything that you, you know, get as a punishment, there is the frequency of that undesirable behavior will, will, will decrease. So this is about positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. Yes, Pratiba. Uh, Ma'am, likewise in sales, I'll tell you this positive reinforcements. Like if you are achieving the targets, so incentives are increased quarterly. So this give a kind of positive uh, feeling in the team that if I am achieving the target, uh, the incentives will increase and they are doing it. Similarly, for negative, uh, it is like like classroom. If certain things is not being followed and the faculty or the professor or the teacher are punishing the students. So this is the way how it works, uh, what I feel, positive and negative reinforcement. Perfect. Perfect. So this is what it is. So this is one. Okay, now, will this, will this, be, a, uh, will this be a good uh, learning um, uh, model for our training programs as instructional designers? What do you feel? Quickly. Uh, no, ma'am. No, Why? no. Why? Uh, because uh, it basically depends upon the kind of person you are training. For uh, Actually, I feel that since so many people are there who are literally very experienced, they have their own way of thinking. If we are using these negative punishment reinforcement, then it will actually uh, have some uh, reciprocal uh, attitudes uh, recovery that we are getting from them. If it's positive, it might motivate them. But if it's negative, I guess it will be more like... Uh, the participants are getting subtle that okay we should stay silent or something like this uh, but but i think it can be used in assessment like, ah exactly yeah. so, so i was trying to understand the pali punishment doesn't mean you're shouting at them or you're yelling at them it doesn't mean yes. that. it means negative marking also negative markings assessments when they um, it, assessment. it might also mean uh, not being able to move to the next level at times level. To exactly them. exactly mm -hmm. No, so I think that that can be explained uh, as an auditor if we are working. So we are auditing as well. So we are uh, giving certain points, right, ranging mm. from 1 to 10. So those kinds of points are also like negative and positive. So I think that can be an example as well. Beautiful. So now you have opened up, all of you, how this classical conditioning or operant conditioning is helping our lives. Now, observational learning, what it is, quickly, observational learning. So observational uh, learning, if I may uh, add on. So observational learning is something uh, which we learn by watching somebody else's action. Uh, so if I take an example, maybe an intern who joins in an organization and would be looking at the professionals, how they are working and they are learning from that. Perfect. That's it. So more sort of a social learning. 
that uh, you know we we encompass in our instructional design uh, and it's an important uh, theory yeah so with this i will break it's 1:30 already so thank you for all your pa very interactive participation i think uh, this keeps us going uh, i'm sure um, you know all of you will will have a uh, a holistic learning at the same time a, a, a learning that is catering to your uh exams exam oriented or uh, you know whatever uh, your syllabus oriented thing so that is how my session is all about so uh thank you for all your participations uh, uh, you know some one person was asking some doubt maybe that person can hold on so otherwise uh, we will all meet in the next class thank you thank you alka thanks a lot dr rajpreet thank you i got the clarity on reinforcement in your last uh, example thank you for that Ma'am, I have a question. The yes, PPT that you are showing, and I was trying to search all this in the book. I was unable to get it. No so worry. Like... <laughs> I know you. Someone will ask this question. <laughs> so because she... for me, this topic is very much new. I haven't studied about it ever. That is why my first class has some basics for you to understand ID. I have not quickly jumped into. you know the 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 first chapter per se okay i'm trying okay. to give some briefs and then slowly entering into it but don't worry i will i will make sure uh, within the stipulated time uh, you get all the all the you know the flow of the syllabus whatever you have mm -hmm. uh, ma'am you'll share the ppt with us right yes i i will be sharing it to nhq thank you so much ma'am thank you ma'am thank, thank you thank you ma'am